Welcome back and welcome to the first major project of this course. In this chapter we'll be working together to create a format with all these features you'd expect including forum categories, forum threads, individual posts in those threads, pagination, a list of members, the ability to view member profiles, the ability to create new users, the ability to reset your password, the ability to edit your profile and a statistics tracker down here which tracks the number of members, the number of topics, the number of posts and who is currently online. You almost have all the information you need to be able to do this on your own. There's only a few things you need to learn which I'll introduce in the next two videos. You'll learn about two tools which will help speed up the development process for you and you'll also learn about web security which is a really important concept to keep in mind when developing an app like this that handles sensitive user data. From then on I'll have videos on each of each piece of the functionality of the app and at the beginning of each video I'll tell you what you need to know to be able to interface with the front end which is what requests you can expect and what you should return to make sure it renders properly and then I would encourage you to give a go to give it a go yourself and try to figure out on your own before progressing with the video where I'll do a walkthrough of the way I implemented it. One important thing to remember is that the way I implement it is my own personal way and it's not the only way and it might not even be the best way. So if you've implemented it in a different way that's totally fine as long as it works well and you've tested it. With that said, I'll see you in the next video where we'll get set up with the project and I'll introduce you to the first two tools that you're going to need. See you then. Welcome back. In this video, I'll introduce you to two new tools that are going to help you in developing this forum app. The important thing to note is these tools are just here to help you and they're not required to, to develop the app and you could develop it using the knowledge you have already. However, they're both going to really help you make your road code more readable and help you speed up your development. The first feature you can see on screen now, and it's at the bottom of this code, it's called module.export. Module.export allows you to export things from a file that can be used in another file, and it can be set to anything, so you could set module.export to be equal to a value or a specific function, but most often we're going to set it to be an object where we can put multiple functions in to be exported and used in other files. This is really helpful because it allows you to split up your code into modular files that have one specific task and makes your code easier to maintain and more readable. So in this case we're looking at the dbconnect file from my forum app implementation where this file is simply responsible for collecting to the database and then returning the database when it's asked for. Then we export it down here, like so, module.exports, and then we can use it in other files. The important thing to note is that the module.exports is calculated at the moment that it's requested. So in server.js, I request dbconnect very early on, and that means once this has been requested once, module.exports can't change. So I have a variable at the top of this file called db, which will eventually be assigned to the database connection. However, it's not set at the time module.exports is called. And so this means if I were to export the db correct this, this uh, variable directly like so, then even when I've called connect, it will export the undefined version of database, which wouldn't be able to be read. So instead, I've created a getter function called getdb, that returns database when it's asked for, which will return the updated version of the database that's connected. And now to show you how module exports works on the other end. So we ex import it by going to the directory relative to the current one. So I've got a folder called custom modules that I've created for my custom modules. And then the file DB connect is in there. And that's relative to server.js at the root of the project. And then you can see, don't worry about all this code at the bottom, I can use it like any other npm module might have installed. So I've got db connect is the name of the module and then connect is the name of the function I've exported. And that allows you to use it just like you would in an npm package. The second tool that's going to be really useful for you is called nodemon. 
Now, node monfix is a problem we've had with the mini project so far, which is any time you make a change, you've had to manually stop the server and then manually restart it, which gets pretty cumbersome, especially when you're making lots of changes quickly. Node mon fixes this by automatically restarting the server for us whenever a change is made to a JavaScript file. So we can install it like any other npm module. However, we need to do npm install hyphen g, and this is the global flag which installs it globally instead of in your project. And that means it can be accessed directly from the command line, which is what we need, node mon. And then if you run this command, it'll be installed. I've already installed it, so I'm not gonna run it again. But then you can simply type node mon in the root of your directory, and it will automatically start the server and restart it when a JavaScript file has been updated. This works because I've specified server.js to be the entry point for the application in the package.json file, you, file for you already, and Nodemon looks at this to see what to run. <clears throat> Finally, it's important to note that in the baseline code, I've initialized package.json without any node modules as dependencies. This is because I expect you to go out and research the packages you need for yourself by using the ones I've chosen as an example, which have high, which are mature and have high downloads, which means they're probably safe and good to use. And then you can install them yourself and automatically they will automatically be added to package.json when you type npm install. So that's about it for the useful tools. And then in the next video, I'll do a brief overview of web security where we talk about the security features we're gonna to need to build into our form app. See you then. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to go over the concept of web security, which is something that is really important to have an understanding of when creating an app that deals with user data. In this video, we'll be going over four main concepts of web security that are directly relevant to the apps we'll be creating in this chapter and the following two chapters. First, it's important for me to tell you that this is by no means an exhaustive overview of web security. And if at any point in the future you plan on making your own app that does deal with real world users and handle their data, then I would strongly suggest that you watch a separate course on web security as it's a concept and in-depth topic that's really easy to get wrong. And if you do, you're going to be exposing possibly thousands of users to having their data stolen. With that warning in mind, let's get on with it. So the first main concept I want to cover is cross-site scripting, and I'll show you what this means with an example from our chat app that we created in earlier chapters of the course. So if I just quickly load it up, one second. Okay, so now our chat app is up and running and all looks good and normal as you'd expect. And nothing's wrong. However, a clever attacker can perform an attack on this app and the attack is you're able to write JavaScript into the chat. And the way you can do this is by writing HTML script tags and opening one and a closing one. And in between these two tags, you can write any JavaScript that you like. So in this case, I'm just gonna write alert, hello, like that. And now if I send it, you can see it alerts hello. Now this is only on our page, so that's not such a big problem. But if we were to open up a new page and pretend to be another user, you can see it also alerts hello. Now, if you're extremely clever, then you can write a much more complicated script than this that might, for example, record all the keystrokes a user makes and then perform an AJAX request to send that data off to your malicious server. As you can see, we haven't even entered our name yet and the script already ran. So if you can imagine in an app where this was created with a login form, that attack would be able to log the usernames and passwords of everybody who use the app because they have this script on our page that we didn't want. 
Without even needing a login form, however, it's possible to target browser elements directly. So they can use JavaScript to fill the message field and then press the send button and send off messages on the user's behalf without their knowledge. And that's something we wouldn't want either. So as you can see, this is quite an important attack to defend against, otherwise you're potentially compromising all your users. And in our format, we obviously have posts and form threads where the users create the title and the text of the posts. And we want to be able to make sure that they are unable to inject JavaScript into those posts and then run them on other users' browsers. The way we defend against this is by sanitizing, as it's called, uh, HTML characters. So if you make sure you encode those angle brackets so they don't they aren't treated as HTML tags and instead just as angle brackets, then it will prevent cross-site scripting and other attacks like it. We won't do this ourselves because this is something that's really easy to get wrong. All you need to do is implement it in the wrong way and it could be bypassed. And so what we're going to use is, is we're going to use a reputable NPM module that does it for us to make sure that it's airtight and to make sure that nobody can circumvent it somehow. So that's the first concept that we've covered. The second concept that we can have an example of is an insecure direct object reference. And we created one of those in chapter two. So if I now start up the chapter two app, one second. Okay, so you can see that I've inserted a file called password.txt here. And if you remember from, pa for, from chapter two, sorry, what we did was we created a we basically just took the request and added it to the current directory to get a file path that we're going to serve to serve the assets in the assets folder. And this was a really good way of making sure all the assets were served because we only had to write the code for one request rather than from like the many, many requests we'd have had to make otherwise. And that seemed okay. However, if we now open it up, you can see that everything loads as normal, but we can access any file on the file system that we want. So if I type in index, if I type in localhost 8080 forward slash password.txt, you can see it gives me the option to download the file. And that is not good if that password.txt actually contains something important. So you can see that's also really bad, but even worse than that, is in Windows, dot dot slash allows you to move up a directory. And so if we did that several times, we'd be able to get to the root of the file system and then the attacker would be able to download literally any file they want from any part of our computer, which is really not good. Luckily, it only exists in chapter two because from then on we've used Express and Express.static is naturally defended against this, so you're unable to do it. The way that we can defend against this is a lot more complicated than XSS, but basically we need a whitelist. A whitelist is a list of approved directories that the user is able to access, and when they send us a file path, we should check it against our approved list of file directories and make sure it's in there, and if so, allow the request. Otherwise, we should block it. There's another type of list called a blacklist, and a blacklist is a th list of things that are not allowed, and you might think that that's okay to use. However, a blacklist is no good because you can always forget an example. So, for example, let's imagine, let's say if I have a notepad file, let's imagine you're trying to blacklist dot dot slash, right? Well, Windows has this funny thing where you could type dot dot slash as many times as you wanted, maybe like 20 times. And if you're already at the root of the file directory, then it won't go up anymore, but it's not an invalid command either. So how would you blacklist this, right? You have got you could have an infinite number of dot dot slashes, so how could you blacklist all of them? Well, you can't. Okay, so maybe what you say instead is that you want to simply blacklist dot dot slash once, and if you see dot dot slash once, 
then what's going to happen is that you're going to remove it from the string and then continue on with the request because maybe they entered it by mistake or maybe there is maybe there is a valid request in there and this is just in the middle by accident so what an attacker might do is dot 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 slash and then what you do is you you've blacklisted dot dot slash and you remove it from the string and you do that and then dot dot slash is still there now obviously you could check again and remove it again but a clever attacker will always find ways around a blacklist because you have to account for every possible malicious attack and you if you forget just one then the attacker has a way into your site for example windows has a very weird feature where you can type dollar signs as an alternative path name to get to different file directories and that's something you can look up if you want and that's something you might not think about and there's many many more besides so when dealing with any sort of web security feature a blacklist is always a really bad idea because an attacker could find a way around it but with a whitelist you're saying what is allowed and so there's no way an attacker can realistically get around it without finding a different way into your app so that's the two that's two concepts covered the third concept is called cross-site request forgery. Now, if you have an understanding of HTML, you'll know that there are forms embedded into the page that submit the values that are in it to the server when the submit button is pressed. So, there's an interesting concept that you might not be aware of, which is usually a form is in a website, and then that form submits to the same website so that's what we've been doing and that's what we will do in chapter 9 however let's imagine you were a malicious attacker there's no reason why you couldn't embed a form into your website that submits to facebook.com forward slash post that's just an example URL that's not what it actually is on Facebook but let's imagine you wanted to post on behalf of a user like so then you could create a form on your website and obviously it's got all the fields in the middle and that form submits to Facebook instead of yours if they've got Facebook open in another tab then they'll still have their login cookies from when they logged in open and even though the request has come from our site when the browser sends off a request to Facebook, it will also send all the Facebook related cookies. So it will look like a perfectly valid request where the user actually wants to post and they've got the correct login cookie, so Facebook will allow it. And then you've just posted on behalf of a user without their knowledge because you could have this form hidden, right? There's no reason you can't have it for display none, which is a CSS property that allows you to hide the element, but it's still there but just not visible to the user. So then what you've done is, you, like I said, you've submitted it on behalf of Facebook, uh, of the user on Facebook, and that's really bad. And in our forum app, we've got the ability to submit posts, and we've also got the ability to create forum threads and edit them. So if we're not careful, then a malicious attacker who owned another website could do the same to our users and post on their behalf or edit or delete their posts, which is not good. And also in our chapter 10 app, we'll be creating a file storage system. And if we're not careful, then they could just go around randomly renaming or deleting files using this method. Now, I'm sure you've never heard of an attack where somebody's actually had their something posted on Facebook without them wanting it. So obviously Facebook has got a defense against this. And um, what is it? The defense is that we have an input. We've got our normal form elements here. So name, password, email, whatever you need for this particular form and then a submit button. And then you add in another input, a type which is hidden. And then you have some random value which is a random string with less as numbers and characters that you name token. And this is a, a one-time form token that you randomly generate when you serve the page. So we'll use handlebars to fill in this value part and we'll randomly generate it and then we'll send it off to the user and remember that random token in the database. 
When the form comes back in the post request, there will be a field called token. And when we see this field, what we'll do is we'll go back to the database, look for that user ID, which we know because they've got a cookie, check what the token is. And if the token matches the one submitted in the form, then we'll allow the request through. Otherwise, we'll block it. And this works because there's no reason why an attacker can't copy paste the form from our website and just change it to display none and then use it to automatically submit with JavaScript. But they could never know what that random value is in advance because we randomly generate it once the user requests the page. And so there's no way an attacker can get that right. And therefore, there's no way an attacker can have the submit the form and have it accepted by our server. So that's how you can defend against cross-site request forgery. And then our final thing is not so much an attack, but an important concept called hashing and salting. And what a hash is, is basically a one-way mathematical function. And we could input any string of characters, no matter how long. And then when we input it, out will come a random string. So for example, we might have my password and through a hashing function, this will become, I don't know, something like that. That's not always the case, and usually hashes are longer than that. But the point is that it's a, it's a kind of like almost, you could consider it a summary of, of the text. So if you had a, a, a 10 page article, the hash would still only be the same length. So you could consider it a summary or a digest as it's called of our string but it looks nothing like it obviously and the real key about hashing is there's no way to go from this digest back to the original password because the password could be longer than the digest or shorter than the digest but the digest is always the same length so immediately we've lost information about how long the string is at the very least so you can see there's some loss of information here and you can't always get it well there's no way to get back lost information and so there's no way to get back from this hash to the original password but it's not random it's not a random string it's a mathematical function and the beauty of mathematical functions is that if you put in the same input, you'll always get the same output. So no matter how many times we put my password through the hashing function, we'll always get the same digest out. So what we can do is we can store the passwords in our database as a hash instead of the original password. And if a hacker somehow compromises our server, all they'll see is a list of hashes and that's no good for them because there's no way they can log in as another user because they still don't know their password. So this is a really useful way to basically have a last line of defense where if uh, you, your uh, site gets compromised, they still can't see the user's passwords and log in as them because we're using hashes instead of the original password. However, attackers have one way around this called a rainbow table. And basically what a rainbow table is, is it has hundreds of thousands of the most common passwords that people use on different websites. And it will, it will calculate beforehand the hashes for all of those hundreds of thousands of passwords and store them in a table. And then what the attacker can do is they get into our database and they look up they find a hash for a user they want to impersonate and then they look up a hash that hash in their rainbow table and they can find the associated password if it's a common one and this is basically a brute force approach but it's faster because it's they're not trying to guess every single possible one they've already done the guessing and they just have to look it up in the table which doesn't take very long so obviously this is bad and one way we can defend against it is to make sure users have a, a really good password. But there are some really good passwords that contain uppercase letters, lowercase letters and numbers that will be in a rainbow table. Like for example, someone's birthday and they might have someone, they might have their birthday and their name with the first letter uppercase. And that would have numbers, uppercase letters and lowercase letters and be a good length. But that might be something that's still in a rainbow table. So we have no real way to check if a user's password is common or not. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that the even if the, they're using a common password, the hacker can't guess it from the hash. 
And the way we do this is with the salt. And a salt is, is a random string. So we just have some random random garbage string like this. And then what we do is when the user submits their password, we take this random garbage string and we append it to the end of their password like this. So now we've got one bigger string. And then with a hash, if you change a password by even one letter, then it changes the hash in a big way. So it's not like this is just gonna be the hash with some things on the end it's going to be a completely different hash so we might have completely different characters and the length will be the same but the, all the characters will be different and now the chances of my password reta thor e5435 being a common password in that attack is rainbow table table is almost zero and so even though they've got their nice fancy rainbow table it's not useful because Every password on our site is made unique by adding a random string to the end of their password. Now you might be thinking, how do we get back their password though? And the way we get back the password is we store this random string, the, ha the salt as it's called, in the table. And it doesn't matter the attacker knows what the salt is because they have to check every possible password with that salt on the end and generate the hash from it. And even if you've got a powerful computer, that's something that will take literally millions of real life years. And it's not something they could do within their lifetime. So it's, it's pointless. So we can store this hash, this salt in the table uh, safely along with the hash and it won't matter. The attacker still can't guess the password. So this is a way where we can make sure that attackers have no access to a user's password even if they get into a website so these are the four main concepts that we need to keep in mind when we're developing our forum app and the apps in chapter 10 and 11 obviously when it's relevant i'll come back to these concepts and i'll show you where they're being used and how they're being baked into our app but as i said if you ever plan to make your own app then please 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 watch an actual web security course by an expert that's longer than this one video and contains all the concepts you need to know because it's something that's extremely easy to get wrong and if you do you're going to leak user data everywhere most countries have fines for leaking user data that are huge in the millions and obviously if your app were to leak user data then the users won't have trust in you anymore and your business will go bankrupt and yeah it'll be a failure so it's something that's really important to make sure you understand if you're ever going to develop your own app for use by the general public anyway that covers web security in the next video we'll start off with the registration on our form app because we need some users first before we can do anything else in the form app you need users that can log in so we'll develop the login system first starting with registration see you in the next video Welcome back. In this video, we'll create the registration system for our forum map, which is the first step in the process. So as I told you in the first video in the chapter, I'll start off by showing you what you need to do. Then I'll encourage you to give it go on your own. And if you get stuck, I'll do a walkthrough. So what you need to try and accomplish in this video is to serve the register.html page when a user requests have forward slash register using the get method if they are successfully registered with your app then you should serve redirect them to registered.html otherwise you should display an error on the register page now the front end interface looks a little bit like this so the register page can just be served as is if this is the first time they're requesting it but if they try and do a post request and it's unsuccessful for some reason, then you can render, you can pass in this render parameters to the page. So you can do a, a render parameter called error and then inside a message. And if you pass these renders, render parameters to the registered page, then it will display an error message. Otherwise, you don't need to pass any render parameters. If you just leave error non existent, then it won't display an error message. When they perform a post request on forward slash register, you should take uh, in the form information and process it and then either return an error or redirect them to forward slash registered. And the fields in the form 
our email, username, new password, new underscore password and confirm underscore password. So you need to make sure that the email is in a valid format and is unique and no other user has it. The username is in a valid format and is unique and no other user has it. And the new password and confirm password are uh, need to match obviously. And also you can optionally include some validation. So for example, must be six characters or longer, must contain an uppercase letter, but that's up to you. So hopefully you can remember all that. If not, then you can refer back to what I've just said, but that should be all the information you need to know about the front end to get started. And now I'll encourage you to give it a go. And once you've given it a go, come back to this video for a walkthrough to make sure you're all right, or if you get stuck for some help. So I'll give you a few seconds now to pause the video here, otherwise, or, and then I'll continue on. Okay, so welcome back. Hopefully you've given it a go yourself and you've been successful. Now obviously we're starting this out from scratch, so I'm going to walk you through every step, including installing the modules. So, um, one sec, let me just seed into the correct directory. Okay. So the first thing we're going to want to do is install all the necessary modules. So we need, obviously, Express and Helmet for security. But we're also going to need a lot more modules than this. So we're going to need a module called XSS, which will validate the usernames to stop cross-site scripting, which I found from the um, NPM library. We're also going to need MongoDB, so we can connect to the MongoDB database. A module called random string will help us to generate random user IDs. A module called moment it, I chose because it helps you to deal with dates more easily and we need to know the date they've registered at. So that's a first set of modules. So let's just wait for those to install. We're also going to need a few more. One is called session. So oh, npm install express session, which is we, we've looked at this before. So for sessions, obviously. And I'm also going to install a module called Mustache Express, which I showed you in the templating with Mustache chapter. Oh, I've spelled it wrong. Okay, so that should be all the modules we need for this registration system. So now what we're going to do is this is the server.js file I already created. So we're going to import all the necessary modules into this file. This might take a little while, so sorry about that. But we need Express, we need Helmet. If I could spell that, would help. Helmet. We need Mustache Express as well. And we need session. Okay, so that's all the NPM modules we should need for this file. And now we're going to do some basic setup. So obviously, the first thing we need to do is create our app and then make it use a few things. So the first thing it needs to use is helmet for security. And then I'm going to do the setup express session. So we're going to add in a secret, which is the key that encrypts all the cookies. And I'll just call it my secret. But if you're using an app out in the wild, then you need well, by in the wild, I mean available to the public, you'd probably want to use a more secure random string than that. Otherwise, someone could guess it. Now, there's an option called Save Uninitialized, which we're going to need to set to true. And that what this means is it will save uninitialized sessions with no variables in the session store. We need this because later on down the line, we, we need to track the number of unregistered users that are browsing the site. And by saving an uninitialized session, it stops us from accidentally counting the same user twice as two different unlogged in users. And then we're going to have an option called Resave which was set to true. Now you don't need to worry about this, but this just suppresses a warning from the express session module. 
And then we're going to make the app use express. Uh, to use the session object we just created. Oh, need to spell again. Okay. Okay. Great. So now we need to set up a mustache. As I've shown you how to do before. Why? Like that. And then that got set the view, view engine to HTML. And then we're going to set the views directory to be the current directory plus views, like that. Okay. And then we're going to serve the, the um, the assets directory using express or static. Ooh, okay, so that's a lot of setup done. And the final little bit of setup we need to do for this uh, section is we need to do express dot URL encoded. And then we're gonna do extended true. And that, again, you don't need to worry about that. It just suppresses an annoying warning from Express. And this part needs to be done because that allows us to process form data. Without that, we can't process forms. So that's what that does. Okay, so hopefully that should be all the setup done, as long as I haven't forgotten anything. And now what we need to do is we're gonna create a redirect function. And what this will do is it will redirect them in, in the case they're logged in. So basically this is just for the future not needed right now, but it will be useful in the future. So we're going to implement it immediately. And what this does basically is I'm going to, I've decided in my setup that I'm going to have a session variable called authenticated. And this will determine whether the user's currently logged in or not. And if they are, then this function will automatically redirect them to the home page, right? So they wouldn't need to go to the forward slash register page if they're already logged in. So if somebody who is logged in tries to go to the register page, we'll invoke this function and this will stop them from trying to register when they're already logged in. So we'll, that will be quite something that's quite useful when we build, when we go along to build the register page. So the first thing we're going to do now, the first real bit we're going to do is we're going to create the register page. And this is to serve the register page, sorry. And then we're going to put redirect as the first function in our list of functions. So what we're using here is redirect. I've done recurrence next, which means it's an express middleware function. So we're going to say this is the first express middleware function that will be invoked if register is called. And then the next one is going to be a custom function we define right now in line like this. And then what we're just going to do is we're going to render the register page like this. And then we're just going to leave the render parameters blank because we don't have any right now, but we will later. Okay. So that's the first part. Now what we need to do is we need to connect to the database. So I'm going to go into our folder here and then I'm going to create a directory called custom underscore modules. That's just what I want to call my directory where I create custom modules and I'm going to create a file called DB connect, which is going to be responsible for connecting us to the database. And then I'm going to open it up over here. Oh, wrong one. Uh, where is it? Here it is. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So what we're going to do in this one is we're going to connect to the database. So we're going to have Mongo client. And then we're going to create a variable called DB, which will assign to the DB. And then we're going to create a client, which is the Mongo, which is what we need to put the URL into. So the URL, you should already know because we've done MongoDB in a previous chapter. Mine is this. This is the default one. And then I'm going to do use new. And again, this this option here, use new URL, new, use new URL parser, just suppresses the warning from MongoDB. Okay, now I'm going, to create a, I'm going to decide to create a function called connect, which unsurprisingly 
is a function that's going to connect to the database and I'm going to have a callback as a as a argument function and we'll invoke this callback once the database is connected so we know we can continue on with the processing of our app. So now we're going to do client.connect to actually connect to the database. And then if there's an error, we're going to console.log error connecting to the database. And then we're just going to end the function because there's no point calling the callback if the database isn't connected because, well, we can't really do anything. Our app won't work without a database connection, so something's gone wrong. And then we're going to connect to the database. And I've decided to call my database the name format but you can call yours whatever you want. And then that means we've successfully connected to the database and then we can call the callback. And then I'm gonna do another function, which is get DB. And this function will get the database, right? Because as I told you, when we were talking about module.exports, which I'm gonna create now, if we just exported the database variable, it would export the uninitialized version of the variable before connection. And if that was to happen, then nobody would be able to you no other, no other files would be able to use the database because they would only get the uninitialized version of the database variable and not the connected one so this was just a get function we need so they can get the updated version of the database once it's connected okay so now we've created db connect and what we can do now is we can import it into our They are DB cat. Okay, awesome. Like that. So now this is imported into our file. And now this is imported into our file, uh, into server.js, we can use it. And we're going to do, we're going to now use it. And we're going to do the, the first thing we're going to do is connect because there's no point starting up the server and serving web pages until the database is up and running. So, this is the first code that will actually get executed. All of this stuff is just assigning stuff to our app. But we're gonna do db connect. And then once we know the connection has happened successfully, we'll actually start a wrap and it will start listening. Okay. So now the second step is to register is to sorry, the third step is to serve the registered page. So if we are actually so if we um sorry to do a post request. So if someone posts app.post to register, then we know they're trying to register and we need to do some processing here. Okay, so as with the first one, we're gonna, as with the uh, post, the get request, sorry, I'm getting very confused here. As with the get request, we don't want somebody to be able to submit form data trying to register if they're already logged in. So we're going to invoke the redirect function up here to make sure if they're already logged in, they can't try and register for a second account. And then we're going to add in some register functions. But for this, I'm going to put it into a second custom module called register.js just to keep the code nice and neat and to compartmentalize the functionality. Okay, so now we've got register.js open, we can start writing it. So now we're going to import a bunch of modules that will be already installed. XSS being the one first one, then crypto. And crypto is a module that comes with node.js by default, so you don't need to install it. And this is what we're going to use to hash our passwords. And then we're going to import another one called binary. And what this allows us to do basically is to deal with binary data because we're gonna generate a salt and the salt will be a random string of binary characters and um, MongoDB by default doesn't have a great ability to store binary strings. So this will just allow us to do that. And then that's not something I'd expect you to know by the way, if you got stuck on that, that's fine. 
but a bit of Google searching would help you fix that and that's how I figured out that was required. And now we're going to do random string which we imported and this is going to generate our unique user IDs. And the last one is moment which we also installed and this will allow us to deal with dates more easily because we're going to be dealing with dates quite a lot. Okay, so I'm going to create some constants here. This is this is basically just something so there's no magic numbers in the middle of our code. So there's a few parameters we need to pass to the hashing function. One is the length of the salt. So um, that's how long we want our random string that we add to the end of the random byte. Sorry, we add to add to the end of the user's password. How long we how how long we want that to be? So it's going to be 32 characters bytes long. Then we're going to have hash iters. And what that is, is the number of iterations we do. So a hashing function can be iterated on as many times as you want. And we're just going to set it to some big number so that it's well hashed. And then we're going to, we want the hash length as well. So this is how we decide how long we want the final hash to be. And we want it to be 64 characters long. That's just what I decided. Something at least 32 characters long is advisable because otherwise the hash isn't very secure. So you should go for something at least 32 characters long. But anything above that is fine. And then we're going to create an another one called default pick URL. And um, all users have a profile picture. And I've provided a default one for you, but I, forgot, I don't expect you to know that again, which you can use here in, it's in assets, image, and then we've got default avatar.jpg. You can, you might have already created your own default avatar uh, for people to use, in which case that's fine. Um, otherwise, then there's that one there for you to use. But if you forgot to do that, then uh, that's okay. I wouldn't expect you to know that, but you can add that in now. And then the first function we're going to create, actual code to run, is return error. And we're going to use this to return an error in the case that they've done something wrong, like the username's already taken, the email's already taken, all the passwords don't match, for example. And we're going to put this in a return error function because we need to we're going to need to do it quite a lot and um, it would be repeated code otherwise so we're going to have some we're going to have a render and then we're going to set the mess we're going to set we're going to set an error and then make the message equal to the message parameter of the return error function this one and this will do the error and then what we're going to do is we're going to add in the things. So if they've already got a username in the form, then we're going to autofill it for them. Like this. Again, I wouldn't have expected you to know this. But you can add it in if you need to. This is just basically just quality of life function function the quality of life functionality that stops people having to enter their username and email again in the event that they get the form wrong and I'm doing the same thing with email here oh sorry what am I doing so we're going to do ren these two render parameters registered username and email are two things you can pass in as render parameters and those will render the those will fill in the form fields automatically and then we're going to render register again because they've done something wrong. So we're re-rendering the page. Again, I want to emphasize, I didn't expect you to know this. This is simply for quality of life. This doesn't isn't needed to make the app work. This just makes it a little bit smoother for users to use. And now we're going to create another function called generate user ID, which guess, you guessed it, will generate a user ID. Now we need this to be in a separate function because we're going to have to make it recursive and I'll show you what that is now. So first of all, we generate a random string 
But just because a string is random doesn't mean it's guaranteed to be unique. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to, oh, sorry, I need to import a database. I forgot about that. Like that. And then we're going to do db.getDB. And then we're going to do dot .collection. And I'm going to put my users into the users collection, but you can call it something else. And then we're going to try and find one. When the, where the ID, I'm going to set the ID, the underscore ID field to be the user ID later on down the line. But you can call it something else if you want, it doesn't matter. And then we're just going to check if a result comes back, right? Because we, we've generated this random string. But the user ID has to be unique. So the only way to ensure that is to check whether or not the user ID already exists in the database. So if there's an error, what we're going to do is we're going to say we've got an error checking if the user ID is unique. And then we're going to try again. So this is a recursive function. If you don't know what that is, then you should look that up in a JavaScript tutorial. And we're going to try again. But yeah, we're going to log it because we don't have any better error handling functionality to do. Else if there is a result, right? If result's not null, then we need to try again because, well, the ID we've generated will exist. So we have to hope the next time around it doesn't. Otherwise, we've got a unique ID and then we're going to call back the callback with the user ID like this. So this will generate us a unique user ID guaranteed because if a user ID is, we generate a random string, if it exists, we would try again. And if it doesn't exist, we call it the callback and the callback is given the unique ID. This has to be a callback function because we've got an asynchronous call in here. So this is an asynchronous function, right? And if we just put it in a while true loop, then what's going to happen is as you know, callbacks are asynchronous, right? So it will do a million asynchronous calls or a billion or however many, but the loop will just keep going round and round and round because while we're waiting for the database, it will execute the new code. And what this will mean is we unnecessarily query the database when the first ID might be unique. So the only way to avoid loads and loads and loads of calls is with a, call, with a recursive function like this. So that's why we made it recursive. Okay, so. Great, so now what we can do is we can move on to actually processing a request. We've got these helper functions here. So now we can start valid, we can start processing the request. And the first thing you should do with any user request is check that it's correct, right? Because the user might have entered something wrong or a malicious attacker might have crafted a request deliberately designed to, craft your, to crash the server. So we're gonna create a function called validate body. And this, exactly as it sounds, it's going to check all of the fields we need are there and they're all correct. So the first thing we're going to do is check, does the request have a username field? Does the request have an email field? Does the request have a new password field? And does the request have a confirmed password field? Right, because a malicious attacker could try to omit any one of these fields by crafting a handcrafted request. And if they did that, then it would crash your server if you tried to look for record.body.username when it doesn't exist, for example, right? So what's going to happen here is if they've got it wrong, then we're going to do res.writehead400 and res.end. And this will return an error code. We don't need to display a nice error message to the user because the only time that we'd ever have one of these fields missing is if a hacker crafted the request, right? From our site, we're never gonna get an invalid request format with a field missing. So this will only ever happen if a hacker is trying to mess with our server. So we'll just display a dirty error code rather than a nice error message. There's no point in trying to make it nice for hackers they are trying to make our, break our website. So. That is that dealt with. Now we need to check the actual things, right? So I'm going to, I don't want my usernames to be longer than 20 and I don't want to, them to be shorter than three because that's what I've decided. And so I'm gonna do that validation. And if 
it's greater than 20 or less than 3. I'm going to return an error. And I'm going to return the error message. Your username must be between 3 and 20 characters. Please try again. And then I'm going to return to stop any more processing in this function. Then we're going to do another check, which is if rec.body.new password dot length is less than six, or it's greater than a hundred, right? Then we're going to return another error, and I've decided the password needs to be at least six characters long. So it's reasonably secure, but I don't want it to be longer than 100 characters because otherwise that's just ridiculous and it's going to take up too much memory on our server. But again, you can choose different requirements if you want and I'm just going to return a nice error message. Okay. And then return again to stop any extra processing. And then the final check is to check, well, do the passwords match? Because obviously if they don't match, we've got a problem. So if they don't match, so this is checking. If they don't match, we're going to return another error. Your passwords do not match. Please try again. And then we're going to return to stop any more processing. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, if that, all that went well and good, then what we're going to do is XSS the record dot by username. And this SS, it's, sorry, this XSS function is going to sanitize this username to make sure there's no cross-site scripting going on. And we need to do this because the username is going to appear all over the site. It's going to appear in their profile. It's going to appear in the list of online users. And it's going to appear next to posts they make, right? So we can't allow them to have script tags in their username because it's going to be all over the site. So we'll do that. And then we'll call the next, which is going to call the next function in the middleware stack. And funnily enough, what we're going to do is the next function in the middleware stack is going to be this. And we're going to do check using unique and we need to do this next because it's some more validation right and this validation is going to check to make sure the username and password don't exist already because if they do then well we need to reject the request because we can't have duplicate usernames or duplicate emails in our system so first thing first is to get the database and then go into the users collection and then we're going to try and find one with this Thing. So there's the OR operator which will check for two conditions and again I won't expect you to know that but Google would have the answer then the OR condition takes an array of different conditions so the first condition is if the username matches the username we've got in the form and then the second condition is if the email matches the email we've got in the form right so if we find a user with either the same email as is in the form or the same password as it is in the form, then we need to decline the request. So we've done that. Now we need to do a callback function like this. And then we're going to say if there's an error, we'll just do some error dealing. And that's just going to log the error for us because there's nothing else better we can do. But then we're going to return an error to the user to make sure if for some reason there is an error. It's nice and well. It's nice. Uh, we, we fail gracefully basically. So if there's an error with the server for some reason with the database. Then we're going to return a nice error to the user so they know what's going on and otherwise they would get nothing back in return and think the website's crashed but this will make it nice and it will just reassure the user the website's still working even if the database isn't otherwise if there's a result then what we know is that the username or the email is duplicated but we don't know which one is which so we need to find out if the email is duplicated all the usernames duplicated so we can give the right error back to the user. 
So we'll initialize an empty error message variable. And then we're going to check if the result.username equals equals rec.body.username, then we know that it's the username that's map the sum duplicated. And we'll send a nice message. Like that. Otherwise, the only other possibility is that it's the email. Because if the usernames, if we've returned, if our results come back and it's not the username, then the email must match. Like so. And then we'll return that error. Otherwise, it's all good. The username and email are unique, no errors. We'll go on to the next function in the middleware stack. And this final function is going to actually register our user, finally. Okay, so this is where it's going to get very complicated. So the first thing we need to do is we know everything's okay, so this user definitely needs to be registered. This user definitely needs to be registered, so we have to register them now. So we need an ID for them, and we're going to generate that user ID, and then we're going to have a callback function that gives us back that user ID, and that's what we're going to use to uniquely identify that user. Next, we need to generate some random bytes, and this is going to come from the crypto module, which is part of Node. You, you can look this up on Google if you need to. And this will generate us our salt. So this is the salt that we're going to salt the password with. And we're going to use that salt length variable we initialized at the top of the file. And then we'll get our salt back. Otherwise, if there's an error, we're going to let, we're going to log. And we're going to return a nice error message just to the user again to make sure we fail gracefully. And I'm just going to copy this one. They don't need to know what errors happened. They just need to know that is an error. So I'm going to say there's been an error like that. And then return to make sure no more processing happens. Okay. Otherwise, we're going to do, we're going to encode it. We're going to encode the salt. using the binary thing that we initialized up here. And this is just going to encode it nicely so MongoDB can deal with it in the database. Next, we need to hash their password before we put it into the database. So we're going to use crypto.pbkdf2. And again, you could look this up. This is the best algorithm for hashing and salting. And it comes with crypto automatically. So we're going to assault it. So we're going to take the user's password, which is in the form, new password. Then we've got this salt, but we need to read it. And we this we need to read it because we've done it in this encoded format. And the salt.read function is part of this encoded format. So we just need to use that because we've encoded it. And you could figure that out from Google. That's exactly what I had to do. There was a problem when I was creating this app of storing the salt in the database and I figured out this is the way to solve it. So you could do this kind of problem solving yourself using the help of Google. Then we're gonna say we're gonna iterate, we're gonna do this number of iterations of hashing that we defined at the top. And we're gonna say we want a hash length out, which is 64 in my case. And then we have to specify the hashing function. SHA-512 is a pretty secure one, um, but there's many others. Just make sure when you choose one that you look for an up-to-date list of secure hashing functions and we're going to do that then we've got our callback function that comes back with an error and our hash password if there's an error console.log error hashing password and we'll return a nice error to the user again we're going to just put that same message. They don't need to know what kind of error, just there has been one. Okay, now we're going to create our document. Now, this is going to be a huge document because the user needs a lot of information about them. So, the first field is going to be the ID, and this is their user ID. 
I call it underscore ID by the way because that's the that field all, always has to exist in a MongoDB document and I might as well set it to the user ID but you don't need to know that you could set it to just be user ID user ID it's like that but by setting it by underscore ID we're gonna get a slight performance improvement but that's not that important and then obviously we need to set the user's username in the, the database and their email and their password and the the hash password that comes back is also in binary form so we're going to do this binary encoding and also so we can check that password is correct again in the future we need to solve we need to put the salt into the database as i told you before and then we're going to set a value of token which is null right because remember i told you that whenever they post something to stop cross-site request forgery they need a token we don't need one for the registration form because they're not logged in yet so they don't have a login cookie and so it doesn't matter about cross-site request forgery because nobody can do something on their account on their behalf because they don't have an account but yeah so we're going to set token to be null just ready for the future when we generate a, a, a token and then we're going to set their pick you the pick the pick url to be default pick url because they haven't chosen their own profile picture yet so we'll just use the default and then i'm going to have the d of b which stands for date of birth which is unknown and then we're going to have the location which is unknown as well now the important thing to know about the fields from pick url well the pick url you need but these two fields and the number the, the ones i'm going to keep on putting in now you don't need to put in yet these ones will all be fields that are important later on when we render the user's profile when we render their profile for other users to see then it's going to be more important because we need all this information to display on their profile but if you don't add it in yet you could always add it in later so that's okay but i'm just going to put it in now to save time later but you don't need to put it in now so that's the important thing anyway the next thing to put in is their join date which is go i'm going to set to new moment and this new moment is going to give us the current time and then we're going to do dot value of which will give us it in a unix um epoch format but you don't that doesn't matter you could just set it to be a new moment but i'm putting it uh, as value of to get the number of milliseconds it is to get a more specific date basically but it doesn't matter you could just use new moment and that would be fine and then we're going to set total posts Again, this is something that's going to do, be displayed on our profile later. And then we're going to store a list of the categories that are active in. Again, that will be important later. I'll explain it later. Don't worry about it for now. And then the most active category, which is going to be displayed on their profile, which is none for now. And we're going to say how many posts they have in that category. Zero, because they've got no posts. Then we're going to have the number of th the threads that are active in. Again, I'll explain it later. Most active thread at the moment is none. They've got zero posts in that thread, that most active thread. Then we're going to have a contact email, which we're going to set to false. Website URL, which we're going to set to false. Facebook profile, which we're going to set to false and LinkedIn profile, which we're gonna to set to false. Again, all of these contact de details will be on their profile later on when we do that functionality. I'm setting them to false because when they're retrieved from the database, if they don't have one, we don't want to render it on their profile and false will stop the uh, templating engine from rendering it. That's the only reason why it's false instead of null. Okay, so finally we can insert this huge document into the database. So we're going to insert it into the users collection. We're going to insert the user document and then we get the error result back. And then if there's an error, we're going to have another error message like this. And then we're going to return an error to the user with the error message of choice again they don't need to know what kind of data internal server has been but just there has been one 
Okay, and then that is about it. So now all we need to do is to authenticate them. So you could choose to have them registered and then make them log in, but I'm just gonna say they've registered, so I'm gonna automatically log them in so they don't have to re-enter their details. So we're gonna add it to their session. We're gonna say they are authenticated. So I remember from earlier, this just says to the session they're logged in, so you know whether or not to redirect them. Then we're gonna set their user ID like this. Again, don't worry about these things for now. If you haven't put them in yet, you can always put them in later. All these are useful for is they're gonna be useful for rendering pages down the line. So we're gonna need their user ID, their username and their pick URL to render that little sidebar you saw in the first video, which has the portrait of them and their name and a link to their profile. But for now, these, these, these aren't important. I'm just putting them in for later, but don't worry about them yet. And that's that. So that was a lot of code. So I hope you understood it all. Um, if you didn't, then go back and watch it. But again, it's not important you understand absolutely everything. A lot of this stuff is just set up for later. But to register them on the most basic level, you don't need it all. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to see if it actually works. Fingers crossed I haven't made any errors. We're going to use Nodemon to find out. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, one second. There's something wrong with the file. What is wrong? There's something wrong. Ah, this is why, right. Let me just quickly change this to server.js instead, and then it will be fine. So there was a problem with the package.json. So now if we type in nodemon, yes, it's great, it's working, okay. So now let's see. So we haven't actually run, we haven't actually, we haven't actually rendered, um, we haven't actually rendered the homepage yet. So obviously the homepage isn't gonna happen, but let's see if register works. Okay, awesome, it's working. It's a little bit messed up looking, but that's okay. We haven't got anything at the top here because we haven't rendered that yet, but again, that's okay. So now let's see what happens. Right, so let's see if what happens if I make a username that's less than two. Oh, okay, my bad, one second. Okay, so it's not actually working yet because we forgot one important thing, which is we forgot to put um, this actual, we've created all this register functionality, but we haven't actually exported it yet. So what we need to do is we need to do, we're gonna export an array here with with a list of all the functions that we're using. Like that. And then we're gonna take it into serve.js so we can actually use it. Okay, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do redirect we're going to do redirect dot concat and concat basically just adds two arrays together right so we've got this one array here and then we've got this other array in register.js and we're just going to concat the two so now all the functionality is there that we should need and then that should all be good so it the the node mon has automatically restarted it for us, but you can see there's an issue here because I've misspelled something, which is okay, we can fix that. So what I've done is up here, I've actually done rec comma body.email instead of dot, so that should fix that. Any more errors? Nope, okay, so now it's working, okay. So now we're gonna try again. So we're gonna just do a Oh, wait one second. I think I've forgotten one thing again. So sorry. 
Right, the last thing we actually need to do, which we still haven't done, is to actually do something. So if it all goes well, we need to redirect them. We need to do a 303 redirection to slash registered. And 303 is just a reg it's just a HTTP status code I chose. You could choose like 301 or 302, that's fine too. And I'm gonna redirect to registered, but we still need to serve registered, right? So we haven't actually, so we've got app.get registered here, but we don't actually have app.get forward slash registered. And without that, we aren't going to be able to actually render that one out for it. So we're gonna do app.get forward slash registered. And then we're going to create another function, actually. Called login redirect. And this is going to be the opposite of the above function. So it's actually going to redirect them if they're not authenticated, right? So if they are authenticated, they're going to go. Otherwise, we're going to redirect them. And then we're going to redirect them to login. And then I'm going to add in this little parameter here. Don't worry about this. I'll explain this in the login video, which will be coming up next. But basically, the gist of it is we're just redirecting them to login. I'll explain what all this stuff is in the next video. But for now, we've got login redirect. So this redirects them if they're not logged in. And we're going to do this on slash registered, right? So on slash registered. They shouldn't be in that page if they're not already if they're not logged in, then why are they on that page, right? If if they've just gone, if they've tried to automatically just type in forward slash registered in their URL bar without being logged in, they shouldn't be able to see that. And then we're gonna then we're going to do another function like this. Which is gonna actually serve it. like this and we, we're gonna have no rend render parameters for now but we're gonna start adding in render parameters in the next video but for now there's none so that's that all done okay is there is any errors no no errors okay right now we can finally go back so now if we do submit you can see your username must be between 3 and 20 characters it's not because I only put in one character so let's try another one like Adam that's four characters, that's fine. This email is fine. Now let's try two different passwords that aren't the same. So let's try this one, test one, two, and test one, two, three. And you can see your passwords do not match. So we're gonna try again. And I'm gonna do test one, two for both. And that should be okay. Okay, great. So now you've got redirect to registered. So now we're registered. But obviously, it still says login because we need to do the re the rendering for this sidebar, which we'll do in the next video. But for now, that's the registration system done. Hopefully, you understood every part I told you you needed to. Some bits I'll explain later on. But for now, you should understand most of it. If not, then I apologize. It's quite a heavy video and quite a big jump from the other chapters. But hopefully, with a little bit of Googling, asking me some questions on Udemy and with re watching the video again a few times you'll get your head around it. I'll see you in the next video where we're going to make the login functionality so somebody can log back into the site on their second visit and we'll do some more rendering. See you then. Welcome back. In this video we'll be creating a login and logout system to extend our authentication functionality from the last video. As before, I'll be showing you how to interface with the front end, then you should give it a go on your own, and then I'll do a walkthrough of how I've done it personally. So you should serve the login page once um, someone get, does a get request on forward slash login. And the interface to render it is as follows. So you've got the error message uh, object as before for the registration system. To put an error message in if there's no error then just leave it blank then you've got login username to autofill the login the username field if they get it wrong and then they have to redo the form again you can autofill it that way and there's also url which is a url that you can fill in and it's the url that 
you should redirect them back to once the login is successful. So when they go to the login page, you should log what, which page they came from and then redirect them back to that page once they've logged in successfully. The form itself has uh, three fields when it's submitted on a post request to forward slash login and that's the username field, the password field and then the auto login field and the auto login field is all lowercase and no spaces and if they've checked the remember me tech box then the value will be on in lower cases the string otherwise it will be undefined so if it's on then you should extend the cookie duration so it extends beyond the browsing session and remembers them for the next few weeks for example so they don't have to keep logging back in then there's finally the logout functionality and th there will just be a post request sent to forward slash logout all lowercase and no spaces and when that happens you should just log them out and then redirect them back to the page they came from so that should be all you need to know about the front end interface. So now you should give it a go yourself and try to implement that functionality. And if you get stuck, then you can come back here for a look at how I did it. So I'll just give you a few seconds now to do it. And once you're done, then come back to the video. Okay, so welcome back. Now we will walk through how I've done it personally. And as you can see here, I've created a file called auth.js in custom modules and this will just be the file that I'm putting this particular functionality in. So we're going to need quite a few modules. Uh, they're quite similar to the ones that we needed for the registration. So that's XSS, Crypto, Binary and Random String. And then we're also going to need the database connection module so we can actually connect to the database and check that the password's right and so forth. Okay, so that should be all the modules we need for now. And now what we're going to do is we're going to create a function to return an error, which is very similar to the one we created the last time. But this one's just going to be used to redirect the login instead of registration. So we're going to do return error message, requires a message as the parameters. And then we're going to have if they've entered something as the username, then we should set. So I'm going to create this render variable, which will be our render object. And we're going to have the message is the message that will be as pa passed as a parameter. And if they've got, if the username set in the request, then render dot login username is equal to rec.body.username and then if there's a redirection URL then we need to also copy that over and render it on the page for the second time and then we're just going to do res.render oh sorry I need a semicolon here and then we're going to render the login page with those render parameters and that's the error done okay awesome okay now we can move on to this so as before we're going to make a validate body function to make sure when we receive a post request to log in that it has all the correct parameters so we're going to check that the username field exists and the password field exists remember the um auto login field might be undefined if it's not ticked so that might not necessarily be there so we're not going to check for that and then we're going to use the same validation that we did for registration right so in my registration module i said that the username has to be between three and 20 characters so if it's over three if it's under three or over 20 characters here then we know it's invalid we don't even need to check the database so then we're going to return an error and then we're going to have the message here i'm just going to copy it over one sec so I'm just going to have a message saying your username must be between 3 and 20 characters. Please try again. And then we're going to return then we're going to return to make sure there's no further processing because we don't want it to process anymore if we've returned there. Then we're going to check the password too. 
because uh, again I made it in my registration code that has to be between 6 and 100 characters so if it's over that we don't even need to check the database again and then we're just going to return another error like so with this message your password must be between 6 and 100 characters then we're going to return to make sure we don't execute any more code otherwise what we're going to do is we're going to set we're going to obviously we're going to then continue processing by first doing an XSS filter on the username to make sure it matches what we have in the database because we filtered it before we put it into the database so to check that they match we also need to filter it and then we're going to have an else statement down here if they don't have a username and a password field in the form then it's a hacker who's trying to mess with our website so we don't need to display a nice error we'll just display 400 band request as an error code and that's it okay so now we've validated the body we can go on to checking if the username and password match what we have in the database with a function called compare password which as it sounds will make sure the password is correct so we're going to get the database and then we're going to look at the users collection since that's where we've stored all the user details and then we're going to try and find the document which has the username that matches our username that we've got submitted in the form like so and then if there's I'm just going to copy this over if there's an error we're going to console log the error and then return an error message to the user and then return to stop any further processing otherwise if there's not a result so we haven't found any result then we need to return an error because that username doesn't exist so we can't compare the password if that user doesn't exist in the inter in the database so we'll return an unable to find the provided username error like so and if that is not true so if we do have a result and there's no error then we can go on to hashing this password so we're going to use the same thing we used before and then we're going to have to read the salt just as before because it's in you it's um encoded using the mongodb binary interface then we're going to have hash iterations and hash length which are two variables which we'll copy over from the other file in a second and then we need to use the sha 512 hashing function to match the one we used for registration and then we're going to have an error and then the hash password come out okay now before i write this callback function i'm just going to quickly copy over the code from registration so we can match the hash iterations and the hash length like so so we'll copy these over up here like so and then just put a semicolon there to make sure it's all, all syntactically correct and now for this callback function what we need to do is we need to check if the passwords match so we're going to first of all encrypt we're going to first of all wrap the hash password in the mongodb binary interface because that's exactly what we did for the password um in the database so now they've done that what we can do is you can do if hash password dot value is equal to the result hash password dot value then that means the passwords match and if the passwords match we can log them in so what we'll do is we'll change the rec the session variable authenticated to true so that in know that we know they're logged in and then we're going to set the session user id is equal to the user's id which i set as the underscore id field and then we'll also set the session username which will be useful later on for rendering the page and then we'll do the same thing with a pick URL, right for now these aren't useful but when we start rendering in the sidebar we need a snapshot of their profile which will contain their username their user id and their pick url so all of these session variables will help when, when rendering that and then what we're going to say is we're going to say if rec.body.autologin 
is equal to on, as I told you, so that means that they want to be remembered. Then I'm going to set the cookies age, so rec.session.cookie. We'll set the max age to a huge value, 3114496, and then a bunch of zeros. And the reason I chose this value is I think if you work it out, then that is a year in milliseconds or seconds. I can't remember which one, but basically it's a long time. So we're just making sure the cookie doesn't expire for a long time and they stay logged in. Don't worry about these errors. This is just, it doesn't like the comparison. If you do a triple equals, you'll get rid of it. Okay. So now that's this part done, but we need to deal with the case where the password doesn't match. And if that's the case, then we need to return an error because the passwords don't match. So we'll return an error, like so, where we just say, incorrect password, please try again. Okay, so that's the compare password function done. And then finally, we're going to create a logout function. And this will be responsible for logging out a user if they do a post request to backslash logout. Okay, so if they want to log out, we're going to set authenticated to false and then we're going to set the pit url to null because we don't want to leave if they're logging out and then we don't want to leave sensitive data in the session right because otherwise the next user that uses the computer might see it so we're going to just make sure that we set all of these variables to null so no information about the user remains in the session and then finally we obviously need to set the username to null too and then we're going to redirect them. And we do this with res.redirect 303, which is just a, a redirection code back. And the string back will redirect them back to the page I came for. So that's logout. Ah, actually, I forgot one thing. So up here, I've set the cookie max age, but if the password's correct, and then if the password is correct, then we need to redirect them. So if the, if the form contained a URL, field then it means we need to redirect them back to that url in that field so we're going to decode the url component because you'll remember if we go back to server.js when we redirect them we pass the url to redirect back after the login as a parameter but we encode it to make sure it's valid http so we need to decode it here to get back the actual url that we need to do it so we're going to decode the url the uri component and then redirect them back there otherwise if we don't have this field, then that means the login request has come from this embedded form here rather than the actual login page. And so we can just, they haven't gone forward two pages, so we can just redirect them to back as we did for logout. Okay, so now we just need to do module.export so that this these um functions are actually available outside the file. So we're gonna set logout equal to logout function. And then we need to pass two functions for the login so we're going to do validate body and compare password because these are the two that are needed to um these are the two that are needed to deal with the login request so now this login file is being created oh sorry this authentication file we can actually use it in server.js and what we're going to do is if we get where our requests here they are if we get a request for forward slash login, then what we need to do is we just need to do actually sorry, so we need to make create array. So first we're going to redirect because if they're already logged in, then they don't need to log in again. So we'll redirect them back to the home page. Otherwise, we'll create a new fun we'll create this function here where we render login like so. And then we're going to have a render object. And the render object is just going to be this. So var render is an empty object. But then we're going to see if request.query.url. So if this field that we set up here has been set like this, then we need to add it to the render object. So we'll do, we'll do render.url is equal to rec.query.url. And then we'll pass in that render object to login. So that's login rendered. 
And now we need to render, we don't need to render anything anymore. So now we're going to move on to the post request. So first of all, we've got the post request for log, logging in. So the same route as before, just a login one instead. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do and redirect again. Because if they're all, again, if they're already logged in, we don't want to log in again. And we're going to do concat. We're going to do concat um, auth dot login because you remember we created that array for logging in so now we've got three items in that array to process the login request and then finally we've got the app dot post logout uh, route to deal with and again well this time we need to do a different kind of redirection so obviously if they're already logged out then they can't log out again so we're going to do login redirect first which means if they're logged in we'll redirect them opposite of the other one And then what we'll do is we will use the auth.logout function like so. And then that will allow them to log out. Okay, so I think that should be it. I was just double checking. So you can see, oh, we've got a problem. Auth is not defined, ah, so that is a problem. So we need to import that module and then it'll be fine. So we just need to import auth like so. Process all, and then it should be all good, like so. And then we'll see if there's a problem. Ah, redirect.concat. I've spelt this wrong, so this is spelt wrong. So concat. I need to change around my letters. Okay, good. So now it's restarted, like so. Okay. So now if we go to login, we should be to get there. Brilliant. And now. Ah. Now we just need to try it. So we'll register quickly. So we actually got a user account and I'll register Adam and just a random email address. And then we'll do a password. So test one, two, test one, two, like so. And we've got an issue. What's the issue? Oh, there's no issue. Okay. It's just hanging. Hmm. Okay, one second. I've made an error. Once I find out what it is, I'll cut back so you can find out what the error is. But the login should be working. Don't know why it's not. I'll be back in a sec. Okay, welcome back. So I found out the issue, and the issue is actually I made an error in the last video. So what I've done here is I've done return rec rest message, but what I actually need to do is do return error. So that's why it was hanging because the user Adam already exists in the database. And so it was hanging because it used the wrong syntax. So now if we try again, then what we'll find out is that this user already exists because I already registered Adam before. So so that is that, that, that's that problem fixed. So now we know Adam exists, we should be able to try and log in with Adam. Okay, so that is not good. Okay, hash length is not defined. That will be an easy fix. So all the problem is here is that we haven't defined hash length properly in auth.js. So I've spelt it wrong here. I need it to be uppercase L, like so. And I've also spelt it wrong in here. But that was fine because it was using the wrong one. So let's just quickly find it. Oh, one second. I need to make it capitalized. So I just spelled I just spelled it wrong once, that's okay. So now I've changed it so it's all uppercase. And now that should fix it. So now we'll try once more. So we'll do it again. Now we'll do Adam test one, two, like so. And then it was try to redirect us back to the home page. Now that means it's working because uh, it's redirected us back because we successfully logged in. But obviously we haven't rendered the home page yet, so we can't see it. But if we go back to login. It won't let us because we are already logged in. So what we need to do is we'll test it properly in the next video, but we need to create the ability to log out. And to do that, we need to render the sidebar, which will be what we do in the next video. And so, yeah, I'll see you then.
Hope you understood it all well. Yeah, see ya. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to be rendering the sidebar that appears on every page, which includes this login box here and this box of statistics down here. We'll also be creating an activity tracker that tracks who is online and who is offline so that we can display that in this box down here. And then finally, we're also going to be rendering the home page for the first time. Although we don't have everything we need to render it, once the sidebar is done, there will at least be something to render on the home page, making it worthwhile displaying. So to start off with, I'll show you the render parameters that need to go into the sidebar, which are here. So the first parameter is authenticated, which is a boolean about whether or not the user is logged in. And if they are logged in, you need to include four more parameters, which is the username, the PIC URL, uh, the time they were last active at, and their user ID. So username self-explanatory, PIC URL is the URL to get a profile picture. Last active should be a string about when they were last active. So if they were online 10 minutes ago, then your string should say 10 minutes ago. So don't just pass in a date. You need to pass in a string that tells you when they were last online relative to now, and then their user ID. And then on the rest are parameters that are quite self-explanatory. Online count is the number of online users that are online. Uh, sorry, online count is the number of users that are online in total. Registered count is the number of online users that are registered. And unregistered count is the number of online users who are unregistered. Most online is the most users that was ever online at one time and most date is the date that that happened on. And then there's a, a list of registered users where each is an object containing the username and the user ID of the registered user that's online. So that needs to be passed to every page, these sidebar parameters once you've created them, since every page has the sidebar. And then obviously you need to render um, index.html when there's a request on forward slash. For now, the only render parameters will be the sidebar. And then you should pass these sidebar parameters into login and register, which we've already started displaying here, as you can see. And that's about it. So now you should attempt it for yourself. And if you get stuck or once you've done it to check that it's right, then um, come back to the video and I'll do a walkthrough. Okay, so welcome back. So you can see here I've put this sidebar parameters into activitytracker.js and that's a new module I'm creating in this video that's going to track who's online and who's offline. So for this module we're going to be dealing heavily with dates and times because we need to know when they were last online and we need to know what the time is now so we can determine if someone's online or offline. And then the modules we're going to need from that we've created ourselves is DB which is the, to connect to the database and a new module which we'll create later on in the video called stats and I'm going to create this module just so that uh, it will track the statistics for us <clears throat> that it appears in the bottom half of the sidebar so statistics will be responsible for all the statistics in this box down here okay so the first thing I'm going to make is a function called activity tracker and this is a middleware function that's going to be used on every page to track when they're online and offline. So there's two cases. The two cases are an online user and an offline user. We need to deal with them differently because we have a count of the online, the registered, sorry, not online and offline. <clears throat> I mean, there's two different kinds of users, unregistered and registered. So we need to handle unregistered users and registered users differently because we have a different count for each. So if the user is unregistered, so if they're not authenticated, in other words, then what we're going to do is we're going to access the database collection that we're going to create in this video called Online Users. And as it, the name suggests, it's going to be responsible for keeping track of the users that are online. And then we're going to update a document. Update one document where and we can identify the, the users unregistered, remember, so we don't have a user ID, but each user regardless if they're registered or not has a unique session id which we can identify them by so we'll use that and then we're going to set the last activity so the last time they were online to be now because if this middleware function is being executed it means they've made a request 
and so we should update the fact that they're online now. So we're we'll set it to new moment dot value of, which gives us the Unix epochs for now, which is uh, the number of milliseconds since 1970, and then username null, and we'll use username null to indicate this is an unregistered user. If they're registered, username will be something, so we can use username is is equal to null to identify all the unregistered users online. And then uniquely, I haven't told you about this, but you can find it in the documents, the documentation for MongoDB. We're going to set an option called upsert to be true. <clears throat> and what upsert means is if the document doesn't already exist in the database, then it will be inserted instead of updated. And this is useful, right, because we've only written an update function here. And if this is the first time the user's ever visited the site, <clears throat> then they won't already be in a database. So upsert will automatically insert it for us. If there's an error in our callback function, then we're just going to log it. <clears throat> activity tracking is a nice feature to have, but it's not vital for the site to work. Without activity tracking, uh, the site will still work. The sidebar just won't render properly. So we'll keep going and we'll keep processing the request for the user and we'll just log the error to the console. And then we're going to check that in the result there's a property called upserted count, which is the number of documents that have been upserted, or in other words, added to the database. And if the count's one, then that means that <clears throat> if the count is one, then that means that they've just been added to the database, which means this is a new online user and they haven't been online before. So we need to update in our statistics module, which we're going to create later, that someone's just come online like this. So don't worry about that function yet. We're just passing in the request object, but that's a function we'll write later. And then we'll do next, obviously. So it goes to the next middleware function in the stack. Now we need to deal with the other case. The other case is that the user's a registered user. And in this case, what we're going to do is, as before, go to the online users collection. But this time we're going to do find one and update. And the reason we need to find one is we need to get the time they were last online to register, to render on the page. So we need to find them and also update their document. And since they're registered, we can find them by their user ID and also their username. And the reason we're doing both rather than just one is, again, if they don't already exist in the database, which is very possible, then we need to add both of these to the database because we'll be creating a new document and we want both their username and their user ID in the, in the database, which we'll see why in a second. And again, we're going to set the, the last activity to the Unix epochs from now using moment. And then we're going to also set their session ID, right? Because online users will present, um, registered users, registered users will persist in the database between sessions, right? So they might log out. They might log out. But they will still be in the database because they're still a registered user. And next time they log in, they'll have a next se a new session ID. So we need to update their session ID because it could be new. And just like before, we're going to set up start to true. So if the document doesn't already exist in the database, it will be inserted. And then we've got our callback function here. Sorry, this is an incredibly long function. They aren't. Okay, so that's done. If there's an error, then what we're going to do is we're going to log it to the database, log it to the console again, and call next to make sure that the function, that the uh, request keeps getting processed, because again, this isn't critical functionality. And then we're going to ret return to make sure nothing else in this function gets executed. And then we're going to check if not result, which means if, there, if we didn't get a result, that means that the find failed. And the only reason the find would fail is if they haven't already been in the database, which means they're a new user. If, there's, if they're a new user, then we're going to set the result object automatically. And the reason we're going to set it is so that um, when we use it down in the next line, it won't throw an error. So we're going to use it regardless, and you'll see why in a second. So we're going to first of all set the request.session.lastactive to be new moment, 
result.value.lastActivity. Sorry, this needs to be this. Result is equal to value. So it needs to be if not result.value. It will return a result, but it might not return result.value. Dot from now. Like that. So you can see we're we're using the va we're using result dot value regardless of whether or not it, we actually found it in the database. So by setting this to be a fake user object, this just results in making sure there's no error down here when we call result dot value dot last activity. Okay. So now the the user session has the last active variable in it. Sorry, it needs to be last active, not last activity. That's because that makes more sense. And so we can use that to render the sidebar because when the user's profile is rendered instead of the login box, one of the things we render is the last time they are active. So we need that to be in the session so that we can use it later on. And then finally, if result.value.sessionID is nothing, so if it's null, which it will be if we set it up here, if it's null, that means this is a new user that we've never seen before, and so we need to add them online, right? Otherwise, then they might have been online one minute ago, so we still treat them as being online, but we're just updating it to make sure they stay online, but we don't actually need to add them to our list of online users because they would have already been added last time. And then we're gonna call next to go to the next middleware function. Okay, so that's one helpful activity tracking function made. Now we need another one. The next one is called switch user type. And we can use this whenever a user logs in or logs out because we'll be switching them from an online user to an, from an unregistered user to a registered user and vice versa, right? So this will be useful in the case of logs in and logs out where the user type changes. So the first thing we're gonna need is to get the username and we can easily get that from the session. like so. However, if they're not authenticated, if they're not authenticated, then their username is going to be null because obviously they're not logged in, which means they don't have a username. And then we're going to create an update document and this is an update document that we're going to um, put into the user's database and we're making it outside of the query itself just to make it a little bit neater. So we're going to set and start taking it on. We're going to set the user ID to be rec.session.userID and then username to be the username variable we just created. Like so. Okay. That's fine. Okay, so that's the update document done. And then we're going to now check if they're registered. So Registered is a parameter that's passed in here as a parameter to switch user type. So we're saying if the user is currently registered, then in the update doc set, we need to set last activity to be new moment, new moment dot value of again the Unix epoch from now. And we need to do this if they're registered. To make sure that we update it right because if they just um if they've currently just if they've just logged in then logging in if they're sorry if the registered is true that means they've just logged in so we're switching them from being an unregistered user to being a registered user and logging in in of itself is an action so we need to account that as an action that keeps them online so we're going to update the new moment the value off like that and then we're going to actually do this insertion to the database now using this update document we just created. So we're going to update one by their session ID, right? Because again, this could be a logged in or it could be a logged out user. We have no way of knowing because we're dealing with both here. So then we're going to insert the update document, which we just created. And then we're going to have our callback function lastly. And again, if there's an error, it's not critical functionality, this statistics tracker. 
So we'll log the error, but we'll keep going because, um, again, it's not a critical functionality. And then we're going to call a function called stats.switchUserType, which is something we'll create in the statistics module later on in this video. And that's just going to turn them from an unregistered to an registered user in the st statistics module. And in there, we're passing whether or not they're registered and also their username. Sorry, their user ID. Username, even. Like that. No, what am I saying? Sorry. So what we're passing three things. I got confused there. We're passing in whether or not they're authenticated, their username, and also their user ID. So we're passing in three things, not not. We're passing in three things, not two. So yeah, those are three things we'll pass in, and we'll use them all in the switch user type function in statistics when we create it later in the video. And then finally, we're going to create an interval function. And this interval function is going to basically be responsible for deleting users. So we're going to create we're going to create a database variable, and we're just going to do that to avoid calling db.getdb three times because we're going to be accessing the database. Sorry, two times we're going to be accessing the database twice. So just to avoid calling that function twice, we'll store the result in a variable, and I want to create a cutoff time. The only real way that we ha when if they log out, then we know they're offline. But other than that, if someone closes their browser, we don't get notified when their browser closes. So the only way we can know if they're offline is by having a cutoff time, saying, well, if they haven't been active in the last, say, five minutes, then we'll treat them as being offline, right? So we need to have some cutoff time that after which we say that they're offline now. And I'm going to choose five minutes. But you could choose anything else. So I'm going to use new moment dot subtract five minutes. So this will give us the time from five minutes ago, and then value off will give it to us as a unit as epoch. And then we're going to access the database. So database.collection online users. And then we're going to find all the documents where the last activity is less than, so S dollar LT is less than the cutoff time, right? Unix epochs is a number, the number of milliseconds since 1970. So a smaller number means it's further in the past. So if a number's smaller than five minutes ago, that means it's further in the past than five minutes ago. And so we need to now treat them as offline. Sorry, I misspelled that. Last activity. Not, there's no B in last activity. Okay. Then we're also gonna, we're also going to make sure that their username is not null, right? So if the username s any dollar any is not equal to null, so if their username is not null, that means it's a registered user. <clears throat> and then session ID, we're also going to check is not equal to null. And we're going to do this because if a user is offline, then we'll set their session ID to be null, and that means that we avoid accidentally removing them twice. So if we didn't set session ID to be null, then when in the set interval function next runs we'd have no way of knowing that we already treat them as not offline as being offline and we'd try to remove them from the list of online users twice which would throw an error so but the session id will be a variable that tracks whether or not we're currently considering them to be online so if it's null that means that they're offline if it's not null that means they are online <clears throat> so we're only looking for users that we think are currently online And then we're going to do a projection. And now a projection is just a fancy way of saying what what fields we want to be returned, right? So if you're familiar with SQL, then it's like select. It's like the select part of the statement. And we're going to do this because we don't want all the fields. We just want some. We don't want them all. All of them would be too many. So we're just going to project get a projection of what we need. So what we need is username 1. And if we say 1, that means we want it. We want their user ID. So that's also 1. And we don't want ID. So underscore ID is the default MongoDB field to track ID unique fields. We don't need that. So we're just going to set that to be zero. Okay, so that's the projection done. And then we're going to return the results as an array. So dot two array, and then we've got a callback. Like so.
Okay, so if there's an error, again, we're just going to log it, but not return because it's not critical functionality. Otherwise, so in the case there's not an error, we're going to do, we're going to call a function called stats.removeRegistered, which will remove registered users from the database and pass in this results thing that we just uh, got from the database to it. So that will be the list of users that needs to be removed. And then we're going to call the database again. So we're going to do database.collectionOnlineUser.UpdateMany. We're going to update all of the documents that we just got returned. So we're going to basically have a very similar query where sadly, um, so you see we've done find one and um, update before. That would be really good to use, but sadly there's no such thing as find one and update many. And since we need to update multiple users and find multiple users, we have to do it in two separate queries. So here, sorry, I'm just going to copy paste it from the code. Here the, the, the search document is going to be exactly the same as above. So we're just looking for the users where last activity is less than cutoff time, username doesn't equal null, and session ID doesn't equal null. And then in this, for, for all these users, we're going to set the session ID to be null. And remember, we're using the session ID as a tracker about whether or not they're currently online. So when we set it to null, that signifies to us on the next go round that we've already considered them as being offline and we don't need to do it again. And then we've finally got a callback function like so. And in this callback function, all we're going to do is log if there's an error and nothing else because this is a set interval function, so there's no callback to be called or no next function to be called. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> now we need to deal with the, this is dealing with the registered users. Now we need to deal with the unregistered users. So we're going to do dot delete many. And again, we need to check for users where the, the cutoff, where their last activity is less than the cutoff time that we created. But this time we're also we're checking for usernames where we're checking for documents where the usernames null, which means they're offline. And you can see this time we're deleting them, right? So for the for the registered users, we want to keep them in a database because we can track when they were last offline in that last online in that case. But for unregistered users, they may never re return to our site. And if they do, we we will have no way of identifying them because we identify them by their session ID, but that could have been changed. Uh, that will change next time they come, so we might as well just delete them from the database to save space. To save space. <clears throat> so again, we're just going to log the error to the console if there is one, and when then we're going to re return to stop execution. But if there's no error, we're going to do we're going to remove the unregistered users, and the reason why we have to return is because if there's an error, we won't have this delete result.deleted account, which we need to determine how many unregistered users to remove. Okay. Now, finally, we need a timeout. So this interval function will run every timeout. So the timeout I'm setting is 60,000, which is 60,000 milliseconds or one minute. So this set interval function will run every minute, and every minute it will delete the offline users. And then lastly, for this module, we've got module.exports. We've got the activity tracker function, which we created. We also got switch user type. And last we've got, and, and, and that's, that's it for now. We will create another function in the next video called check if online, which will check if users are online. But for now, we're not going to create that. <clears throat> so that's that done. That's the two functions exported. Now we're going to create the statistics module. So this is another empty file, which we imported here. So statistics. So we're going to create this now. So for this uh, module, we're going to need a moment again, because this is dealing heavily with dates. And we're also going to need the database module so we can query the database.
Okay, and then we've got the stats object. So this stats object will include all the statistics that I showed you before, minus the user specific one. So there was five user specific ones, which we won't track here. Here we're just tracking statistics for everybody, that everybody needs in their sidebar. So we won't uh, track the users, the user ones, but we will track. We will track these ones. <clears throat> Sorry. Right, okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to create a function called generate stats. And this will run every time we start up our server so that we can generate statistics from the database. And again, we're going to get the database as a variable. And now what we can do is database.collection users. So we've already created the users collection because we're registering and logging the users. And then we're going to do .count documents. And count documents will return the number of documents in the database. And since we have one document per user, this will return to us the number of users that exist in the database. If there's an error, we're going to log it and return. Otherwise, we've got a statistics module object up here. Stats.total members equal to results. So the result will be the number of users. And we can set the number of members to be this. Um, one second, sorry, I think I missed something. Okay, no, I didn't miss anything. Sorry, right, okay. Let's keep going with statistics. <clears throat> okay, so we've got this now. Now the next query we're going to do is database.collection most online. The most online collection is something that we're, we're le yet to create, but we will create it in this module now. So we've got find one and we're going to find one by an empty document because in our most online collection, we're only going to ever have one document. So we'll just return that one document into our callback. Then if there's an error, we'll return it. Otherwise, if there's a result, so if there's a result, it could be that we haven't created it yet because we've never had a user online. If this is the first time we're booting up the server, then we might not have a document. But if there is a document, then stats.mostOnline. It's going to be equal to result.count and stats.mostDate is going to be result.date, like so. Okay, and then finally, we don't need anything else right now. We will have to generate total posts and total topics later, but we haven't actually created that functionality yet. So for now, we're just going to generate the, we're going to get these two, and then call back. Then we're going to create a function called get stats, which, as you might imagine, will return the statistics module, the statistics object here. And just like with DB, we need this because when we update it, it won't be updated in module export. So instead, we do get, we do um, get stats. Then we're going to create a function called add user, which will add a user to the database, unsurprisingly. And we just do stats.totalmembers++, plus plus. so sorry, not the database, but to this object. And then we're going to create the function add online, which we used in um, activity tracker, if you remember. And we passed in the request object from activity tracker. So we're going to say if request.session.authenticated. So if they're an online user, then what we're going to do is if stats dot registered users dot index of we're going to create an object here. So we're going to create an object here. Request dot session dot username. 
So use name is equal to this one. And then user ID as well. Request.session.user ID. So basically what we're doing here is we're checking and then we're gonna say sorry, if it index of if index of equals to minus one. We're just checking that the user isn't already in the object, right? Our set interval function to delete users only runs every one minute. So it is possible that in that time there'll be some overlap where there is a user that's treated as unregistered, it's treated as offline, sorry, but they're actually online. So to avoid problems with that, we're just gonna check that the user's not currently already in the list of online users. And if they're not, then we'll add them. And we will do stats.registeraccount++ to say there's one more registered user. And then into the registered users list, we will push that document like so. Okay, so that deals with, um, that deals with, um, unregistered users so sorry it deals with registered users in the case of unregistered users we just need to uh, increase the unregistered account by one nothing else and then obviously we also need to create this we need to inc increment the online account by one in either case because the online account represents all users so they will definitely be incremented by one and then finally we're going to do a check so this check is going to say if stats.online count is greater than or equal to stats.mostOnline, then that means that the current number of online users is greater than the most online users we've ever seen or equal to it, which means we need to update stats.mostOnline to be the new count. And then we're also going to say stats.mostDate is equal to new moment, so the current time, dot format and then we're going to do the format d-o-m-m-m -M -M -Y, -Y, y which will just return the current the day the month and the year in a format that i like but you could choose a different format and then we're going to insert it into the most online collection so so we're going to update it update one And the query will be an empty document again because we only ever have one document in this database. And then we're going to set the count to be stats.mostOnline. So that's the count of the number of people who is online and the date to be stats.mostDate. And again, it's possible that this object doesn't, this possible that nothing exists in the online database yet because if we, this is the first time the user's ever been, the, sorry, the server's ever been run, then nothing will be in this collection yet. So we're gonna set up cert to be true. So it gets inserted if it doesn't already exist. And then we've got a callback. And in the callback, we're just gonna check for an error again and nothing else. So we're just gonna say error updating most online in the database and that's it. And then that's that function done. And now we need to create some more functions, unfortunately, even though it's been a long video. So we've got add online, but if you remember an activity tracker, we've also used in the set interval function, we used two more functions, stats.remove registered and stats.remove unregistered. So we need to create these two functions as well. So first of all, we're gonna create remove registered, which will remove a registered user. Sorry, remove registered users, right? We pass in a list of users. So we're gonna do stats.registeraccount minus equals users.length. So that users is an array of the users to remove. So length will be the number of users. So we're just we're removing them from the registered account and the online account the number of users. And then we're gonna loop through the, all the users in this list. So users.foreach will do that for us. And then a callback where each one's the user. Like so. And then what we're gonna do is for each user we'll do stats.registered users dot splice stats dot registered users so splice is how you can remove splice is how you can remove um items from the middle of a data the middle of a list right because these users could be in the middle of the list 
So stats.registeredusers.index off. So we're getting the index to remove them from. And then one to say we will remove one item in that index. So that will get the index of them in the data in the uh, in the list and, and then remove it from the list. So that removes them from the list like that. And that's remove registered done. So we've Remove them from the list and re remove them from the count, so that's done. And then stats.remove unregistered is much easier. We've just got N. Remember in Activity Tracker, we passed in the deleted count, so we just got a number that we need to remove. And then we'll just decrease the unregistered count and the online count by that number. Simple. And then finally, you'll remember that in switch user type in activity tracker, we use switch user type in we use switch user type in um, statistics. So we'll create this last function here. Don't worry, we're coming to the end now. Where we are passed in authenticated username and user ID. So we're going to say if authenticated. So if they're authenticated, then what that means is they've just logged in. So we need to increase the registered count by one and decrease the unregistered count by one, but the online count doesn't stay, it doesn't change because the number of online users is the same. And then we're gonna add them to the list of online users like so. Otherwise that means that they're offline. And so what we need to do is increase the unregistered count decrease the registered account and then remove them from the registered users list rather than adding them and we're removing them in the exact same way as we did up here we just have to make the object ourselves because it's not passed to us okay <clears throat> so that's all the um functions for statistics finally so we've got gen stats get stats Add user, and then we've also got add online, remove registered. Oh, that's the wrong one. Remove registered. Remove unregistered. Switch user type. And that's the last one. Hooray, we're done. Okay, so now we still need to start using all these um, functions in server.js so they're actually useful. So we need to import both of these. Um, we need to import both of these modules here. So we're going to import activity tracker. Require dot slash custom modules for slash activity tracker and then we also need to import statistics dot slash custom modules statistics okay nice now I'm just going to even this out a little bit so it looks nicer Okay, lovely. So that's the two modules imported. And now we need to use them both. So we're going to use it here. So app.use activity tracker dot activity tracker, right? So that activity tracker middleware function needs to trigger for every request because it updates when they were last online. So we're going to use it for all routes and it will be the first function executed, like so. And then what we need to do is we need to render the home page. So we'll do that down here. So app.get forward slash. Then we're going to create a function called get params. We haven't created it yet, but we will in a second. And then we'll have our last function that's just going to render it. So we're going to do res.render index with request.render parameters. Okay. So now we'll create the function called get params. Like so. So what we're going to do in get params is we're going to get a copy of the stats object, so called stats copy. And we need to create a full copy of it to avoid accidentally modifying it. 
And the way we do that is use object.assign. So to an empty object, we'll assign stats.getStats. And we'll create, again, I said we'll create, if we if you just said stats copy is equal to stats.getStats, then whenever we modify the object, that we'd be modifying the object in statistics itself because we're getting a reference to the object. But instead, we need our, our own object, not a reference to one. So we create a full copy of the object <coughs> that we can use and modify freely. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say if request dot session the authenticated. So if they're logged in, stats copy dot authenticated is true. Stats copy dot username is equal to request or session dot username. Stats copy dot pick URL is equal to request dot session dot pick URL. Stats copy dot last active is equal to request dot session dot last active. And then finally, stats copy dot user ID is equal to request dot session dot user ID. Okay, so that's all of the render parameters passed in. If they're not authenticated, we don't need to do anything. So then we're going to set request dot render parameters to be stats copy, so we can pass it down the line, and then we're going to call next. So you see they're automatically used in request dot render parameters here. But that means we now need to add get parameters into the stack of all the requests. So for anything where there's a get request, we need to do get params. So we get the sidebar parameters. Like so. Okay, so that's all the get requests. And then instead of passing in an empty object in each of these things, we need to pass in request or render parameters instead. Okay, I think that should be everything. One thing that we are missing though is if you remember in statistics we created a um, function called add user, but we need to use that in the login. So when somebody when somebody um first registers in register, we need to add the user. Because uh yeah, we need to add the user. So because we've just created a new user, so we need to add them to the total users count. So we need to import statistics here. Okay, we've done that. And now we need to use it. So we can need to use it down here. Uh, so when it's down here, once we've done all this stuff, we know that this is um that they've successfully registered. So we do stats dot add user, like so. That's literally it. So we've imported the stats correctly. Yep. And in statistics, we've got a function called add user. So that's that. Okay. So awesome. That's all done. So now we're gonna check. Okay. So nice. So we're gonna re reboot the server just to make sure it's all working by typing in nodemon. Okay, it is, nice. So now we should be able to go to the home page. Oh, okay, one second, there's an error. Ah, yes, I see the error now, okay. Where are we? In server.js, get parameters is a middleware function. And we haven't actually passed it in the middleware function parameters. Request next. Okay, so we'll fix that now. Reboot the server. Okay, now we should be able to try again. Okay, awesome. So you can see there's this is a bit empty down here, but that's because we haven't got any posts yet. But now you can see that we've got members, topics, and posts, which is awesome. There it says one user's online, which is us, one guest. So this is we're a guest at the moment. We're the only user online. Okay, so now what we need to do, what now what we should build, oh, actually we're missing one more thing, my bad. So the last thing we're missing is gen stats. So if you remember, we created a function called gen stats. Uh, okay, so this needs to move down here. Sorry, one sec. Right, so we're moving this down here. 
once we've connected to the DB, we need to do stats dot gen stats. And then we've got our callback function again. And in here we'll do app.listen and this will generate the stats. And I've automatically populated my database with a bunch of dummy data using a module called Fakerator. So that created some fake users for me. So you should see now when I when now you, the thing's restarted, you'll see that this members count just shot up because we, I've got 4,955 fake members in my database. Okay, so it still says we're the only online user, which is good because we are. But now we should be able to log in. So if I remember correctly, I created a user called Adam and the password test12. Log in. Yep, okay, great. And now you can see it's rendered with my profile. Last visit was a few seconds ago because we just logged in. And um, it says that we are on, that there's two users online, one registered um, and one guest. And the registered one is us. The guest is also us, but um, there's not much we can do about that. The guest one will be removed once the set interval function at, that runs every man one minute runs. So that will remove the registered guest. But having one person duplicated is not the end of the world. So you can see that we've got the statistics tracker working. There is one slight bug in it. Oh, actually, cutoff time is not defined. Okay, that's not good. So what happened is um, we've uh, misspelt a variable name in um, our activity tracker. So we've misspelt cutoff time somewhere. So yeah, we misspelt it here. So cut should only have one. One T, not two. Okay, so that's fixed now. All right, but yeah, as you can see anyway, it will log us out now because we just, the server's restarted. But as you can see now, we've got it rendering properly. It's rendering us, um, it's rendering us our sidebar and the statistics is working, although the, on the, um, Statistics, the activity track is not perfect, probably because we made a mistake somewhere. And if I do find a mistake, then I'll tell you in the last, the next video um, what it was. But anyway, yeah, so that, it's been a long video already, so I'm going to end it here. In the next video, we'll be doing password reset. And if I do find any problems with my activity tracker, then I will tell you um, what they were in the next video. So see you then.